And I did promise Fariba that she could have some of my time. Glad that you used it profitably. Uh, let's see now. Okay. Um, we seem to be going through these talks in a reasonably logical order. Mark Maurice gave you a nice overview of international in general. I'm hearing, I'm seeing in the back that people are not hearing me. What about now? That's the best I can do? Okay, I will try to talk loudly. The microphone's as close as I can go without feedback. Uh, Mark gave a nice overview of the international operation in general. Kyle, uh, by virtue of taking over the whole thing uh, in just a few months, and also the fact that Eort is 60 years old, was able to go second. Eort is celebrating its 20th year birthday this year, and at least that puts me ahead of Jim Filler up at SOI. Um, for the name slide, I put my name rather than the name of the program because it's an easy way to introduce Dr. Masoon Ma, who will be taking over at the end of this month. This is more or less my last official action. A brief description of the portfolio really doesn't need much description. We're detachment two of AFOSR. We track very closely AFOSR's BAA. Because we're the laboratory's only asset in Asia, we take that very seriously. We have a wider customer base. We work the 6263 world with the laboratory in cooperation uh, as true colleagues. We also work with other DOD agencies of necessity, frankly, and with federal offices other than DOD when it makes sense. But overall, our portfolio pretty clear, closely matches what AFOSR does. Now, you've heard that we tend to work based on who we are as program managers. But beyond question, we also tend to work statistically based on, on the area in which we work. Asia has very clear strengths in general. Uh, material sciences, for sure, lead the world. Electronics, very, very good. Uh, nano, bio, very good. And also emerging more and more information sciences. And I'll give an overview of how we invest, but you'll see a large majority of what we do falls within those categories. Uh, for our AORD 101, it's essentially the world in which we work, the constraints that we face, and what we're able to do within those constraints. Uh, using the same map that Mark Maurice used, and in some senses, it makes our area of the world look comparatively small. But we actually face the biggest problem of all in terms of how we're able to travel and interact with our community. It's a huge area that we cover, including the fact that a large fraction of what we do is interact with people domestically. Our customer base is largely on the east coast of the United States. Even if you can catch the direct flight UA803 and 804, that's an average of about a 13-hour trip. 12 hours down to Melbourne, nine hours over to the um, east side or west side of India. Those are constraints that cannot be overcome, but in fact, I think they force us to work in a rational fashion that leads to the best bang for the buck for the Air Force and overall the best impact that we can have. I'll get to that in a minute. Kyle showed a marvelous graph with, with how uh, EORD's investment over time tracks with the European framework. Uh, dozens of countries, we have very few countries with which we deal uh, in general. We cover a dozen countries, but Mark Murray showed that 96% of the domestic or the investments that we make in region fall within only six countries. Uh, as a challenge, within those six countries, there are a lot of centers of excellence. And that puts a burden on us to be able to use our time profitably to engage what turns out to be about half the world's population. Uh, for us, relationships are everything. It's become an, an unassailable fact that relationships tend to be harder to build in Asia than they are in the rest of the world. I'd rather not go into cultural explanations now. I, I believe it to be true. But relationships are how we necessarily have to work. There's simply too few of us to work any other way. Uh, one of the advantages that we have is that uh, we've been around now for 20 years. AFOSR has been around for 60 as a beacon for basic research in the public domain. And we have, over our time, only been AORD doing that. AORD, for example, has actually morphed over time. With that as a single mission, being able to stay with that, we've been able to open a lot of doors in Asia that I think people predicted we would not be able to open. Uh, the, phrase that we use is basic research opens all doors, and it's absolutely true, but we've heard a lot also over the last couple of days, especially with relation to autonomy, on the subject of trust. 
These are very definitely trusting relationships in which we enter. They tend to be very serious in Asia. And the fact that we have a mission that can be understood and trusted is how we are able to do our jobs. Uh, it's important that we build on past successes. And I think I have a line in here uh, later on, actually, about uh, relationships, at least very fortunately for us, are transitive. I've spent nine and a half of the last 10 and a half years of my life in Asia. Um, Ms. Soon has been spending almost as much, so she has her own relationships. But for the vast majority of the relationships that I have, will pass very nicely to her so long as we go through the exercise of making sure that we do so. I want to point out, though, another aspect of the relationships, though, that we deal more and more over time, necessarily and quite profitably, in terms of true partnering. So when we represent the laboratory or we represent AFOSR, we're partners with our program managers, partners with the management here, partners with the researchers in the laboratory, partners with researchers with whom we work in theater. Now, that partnering can be just investment in individual researchers, and don't worry, I'll pick the pace up here in just a minute, but also in terms of taking advantage of large-scale investments that a region or a country might make, and you'll see more of that going forward. Okay, I'm gonna give you a very quick overview of countries. Kyle did a marvelous job of a couple of brilliant examples showing how EORD works. No need to repeat that with respect to AORD, plus you'll see examples throughout the week. Uh, Jamie Yu and Joe Lyons gave very nice examples yesterday. Uh, little snapshots of, of the countries. Japan's the biggest country with which we deal. They're, they're number three in economy, number three in terms of publishing. They're an aging, socially responsible country. So over time, they're putting more money into things that really I don't care all that much about, uh, green innovation, uh, quality of life. Good for the country, not so good for us. The, the laboratories are still marvelously well equipped. And for our purposes, there's a, a nearly inexhaustible supply of good research with which we could invest in Japan. And we're the only Defense Department agency that's able to do that. Korea, considerably smaller, but still a very broadly based economy. Very good strengths that we invest in in nanoscience, materials, electronics, and emerging in brain science. But also, we've developed relationships with both Korea and Taiwan where we're able to deal directly with our civilian funding agencies and look to see if we can leverage funds. So for example, you'll see some funding statistics later on that show that AORD invests a fair amount of money in the United States. We do so because we pay our partners to work with Korean and Taiwanese researchers in the areas of nanoscience and nanotechnology. Uh, for us, Australia, huge partner, very obvious. The Australian line is that scientifically they tend to punch above their weight class. That's absolutely true. They don't try to invest in everything. Where they do invest, they try to do it very, very well. For example, uh, this organization, NICTA, which we heard a little bit about last week, and I think some yesterday, that's an organization of 700 people focused in universities focused on information sciences. They have an enormous number of terrifically talented researchers. Quick coverage of our last two big ones. India, completely different. Huge country, a truly inexhaustible supply of smart people. Uh, you know, English speaking, democratic country, what, what don't you like? For us, we do see value in certain subjects. Again, it's a country that's solving a lot of problems with its research, and a lot of the research isn't of particular interest to us. 1.1 billion really smart people is, and over time, I think you're gonna see these investments grow. Singapore is a bit of a surprise. Five million people, come on, how important can five million people be? Again, they tend to do niche investing, they tend to try to do things well. But the types of things that I follow, I'm a material scientist. My favorite subject to look at is applied physics for what you're going to look for in the future that the Air Force might use. In the fields of material science and applied physics, Singaporeans write papers at a rate between five and 10 times the US on a per capita basis. Uh, their rejection rates are a little bit worse, but not so bad. And their scientific citation rates are nearly as good as ours, 10 to 15% less. So there you have a country of five million people niche investing and becoming for us effectively a much larger country of concern, of consideration. Uh, they also, we do initiatives with countries. We look for opportunities there, but in general, we invest in brilliant individuals. When possible, we knit them into a more coherent community, into a larger community. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities throughout Asia, and you do see, see that. We have dozens of investments over the years in countries other than the big six. 
China is very definitely the subject for another day. Um, we've, we've heard that they've passed us in numbers of publications. Fortunately, numbers are not everything. Um, we have restrictions on us with what we're able to do with China directly. Approval is required. We engage them to the extent that we can, but they are not a major player for us. Approaches, uh, I don't want to dwell on this. We've already talked about it a bit. Relationships are very, very important over there, and they are not done by email or fax. They're done face to face. Now, fortunately, relationships doesn't mean that an AORD program manager has to directly engage his or her counterpart. Uh, Mark Maurice used to use the line for years that the laboratory was thousands of, of eyes, thousands of internationalists. And it is still true. What we try to do is have relationships with the right people on both sides of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we have a huge range of researchers here and the extended community we have with all the PIs that, that you see uh, being talked about over this week. We've come to know more and more in essentially a linear progression fashion, people with whom we can work in the region, so long as we can bring them together and we have the mechanisms to do that with travel support, what have you, good things will happen. The vast majority of what we do must be obvious by now that we do research grants. International granting tends to be different from granting domestically. We tend to start with small seed grants, which are appropriate to the prevailing costs. Low overhead grad students are comparatively cheap. We don't pay for equipment. They already have good equipment. Almost everyone in whom we invest is already successful. One of the advantages when we can put in larger grants is that money can be spread out and we can start to bring in a mix of younger researchers. We've been doing that with the generous help of our colleagues here at AFOSR more and more over time. And we're starting to see some real benefits from that. And that's also planting the seeds for the relationships that we're going to want to have going forward. Um, with respect to follow-on grants, nurturing true partnerships, that's the goal. 10 years ago, the goal in, in AORD was to invest in the best science we could find. Uh, at the time, very appropriate goal. The goal very clearly now is to have the maximum impact from the investments that we make. And that usually involves bringing people together. And keep in mind that we open, with our investments, we open the PIs to the wider world of the US Air Force research community. We're a prized partner. Complementary expertise, capable collaborators, uh, again, all the PIs that, that AFOSR funds. And also, very definitely, we see this as a transition partner. People in general overseas are eager to work with us for all that we can offer to them, so long as we can make that message clear and they understand the benefits. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Uh, Dr. Russell talked about the 10 basic areas, how AFOSR is structured. We invest about like you would expect in those 10 basic areas. Asia's really good in materials, really good in things like electronics, electronic materials, what have you. And those are somewhat hypertrophic. Everything else is comparatively well distributed. We're a little lean in plasma physics and non-equilibrium processes. I imagine that will grow over time. To date, we simply haven't had a program manager at AORD who's been able to do much about that. As we heard from Kyle, that going forward will be less of a constraint because we'll be able to work in the new con construction around the world, taking advantage of expertise on the program management side where we can find it. A quick snapshot of how we invest. Uh, conferences are pretty important for us, a great way to, to find the right people, establish relationships. Unsurprisingly, the big six show up again. Thailand is, is a fairly large slice simply because it's a really great place to hold a good conference. Uh, we actually do a little bit of investing out of theater. We'll do things together with EORD, for example. With respects to research grants, just as you would expect, Korea is a little bit low because remember, in the nanotechnology, the nanoscience work that we do, we're investing in the US partner to partner with Korea. Taiwan is a little bit lower as a result, but still looking at that distribution, I would say the next place that we should hit yet again would be Korea. There's an enormous amount of value there. Okay, wow, I did pick up the pace. Last slide. Uh, it says Australasia. I've gotten so used to using that term, I don't know that it's necessarily appropriate here. Australia's economy is very strong, driven largely by exports of raw materials. That economy is going to continue to be strong. When I started AOR 10 years ago, it was two Aussie bucks to one US buck. 
Now it's a dollar seven US to one Australian dollar. They're doing very, very well, and they're investing wisely in the future. However, Asia itself is growing at a much more rapid rate than Australia. Also, the investment in science and technology. Dr. Russell pointed out very intelligently that 6-1 isn't the same thing as investment in s and and then Mark pointed out that at least to some extent track. But in the countries that we focus on, what you see more typically is Singapore moving up to 3.5%. Japan and Korea already there. Taiwan moving toward 3%. These are countries that have a commitment to investing in science and technology, and they have the advantage that their economies are growing in double digits. India is especially strong right now. So over time, and we've heard this from President Obama on down, Asia is going to be a good place to be. For us, there will be the question of how much we'll be able to do with China, how we'll go about engaging them. At this point, we're doing the best we can, and I like to believe that we have a fairly good understanding of what's going on over there, and we have a reasonable set of relationships that can be uh, benevolently exploited when they need to be. A uh, network of relationships, uh, I seem to use that word almost as often as the Article D, but for us, relationships are very important. Uh, we work very hard to establish them. We're selective in how we establish them because in Asia, relationships tend to persist and one wants to be careful about not having the wrong types of relationships. We're going to continue to expand that base domestically and internationally at a controllable rate. Uh, AORT has grown very rapidly over the last decade, and we've tried to grow in a sustainable fashion I think you'll see that we'll be no longer talking quite so much about AORT and thinking more globally about how we invest internationally, but we will see, I think, continued growth within the region. Uh, Defense Sciences Board just came out with a big report, and uh, international was a big part of it. Not international in general. They focused very definitely on having true partnerships, not some sort of Marshall Grant where you drop money off and hope that good things happen. Advancing the right science is a great idea. Partnering is even better. Uh, we pioneered some of the partnering mechanisms that we're using where we're not even having to pay the country to work with us. I think you'll see more of that going forward rather than less, simply because the countries themselves and the researchers don't necessarily need our money, but they very definitely prize the relationship that they can have with us and what we can do to help each other going forward. And with that, with three minutes left, I'll get off the stage. Thank you. <laughs> Keeping in mind, lunch is next. Are there any questions? <laughs> Are there any questions? On your slide nine, you had uh, 154 research projects. So what fraction goes actually into the country and what fraction of the money is actually for a collaborative activity with, shall we say, someone in the U.S. working with someone okay. in one of those countries? So the question is, uh, of this money, how much of it goes directly into the country? This, these grants are written to institutions, individuals, in these countries. So on a first cut, all of it goes into there. The way it works is that I would estimate that probably, and this is an estimation, fewer than 5%, but very far above zero, actually goes to directly seed the cooperation. Part of it will be travel money, where people will come to the US, partly will be for exchange of students. But the, the money that you see there, and it's not big money, you notice there are no dollar figures on that. Uh, you saw. I think before that international is about 3% of the total, but, but that money largely goes to those countries. So the me measures, first of all, I, I think um, I'm a great, great supporter of I international scientific engagement from a whole and government perspective. It's, it's uh, not only the, the President's uh, direction and the State Department's direction, but it's good, it's good policy. Um, my concern is, is uh, mostly what you've expressed here are process metrics, uh, no outcome metrics. Sure. And so what I'd encourage you in the future is to measure. So you, you actually alluded to one, which was the number of non-paying participants. Um, it would be wonderful if that was 100%. Um, it's probably 1% or, or few, it's probably a, a single digit today. Well, um, but uh, let, me, let me just suggest, for example, in the tipster program, 
uh, one of the things we used as one of our measures was the number of unfunded participants, which, oh, by the way, arised up to yeah. two-thirds of the program, mm -hmm. which basically uh, multiplied the government's investment. So um, another good measure might be time to market. Um, or that is, mm -hmm. um, you know, a discovery if, if in fact, Korea um, or, or Thailand or whoever is, is, is focusing in a niche and we can accelerate the development and the deployment of a capability, that would be a good measure as well. So I just encourage you to develop those and be part of those well, in the we, future years. We happen to have four teams dedicated to essentially re-engineering international right now. Uh, metrics and outcomes has been a big part of what we discussed. I presume there was someone in the audience taking notes for what Dr. Mabry said because those absolutely should be part of the consideration. Thank you. Okay, let's thank our speaker.